ESPN Radio 1080, the team. ESPN1080.com presents round three, your show for all MMA news. I'm Eric Lopez alongside our MMA guru, Brian Whittaker. And Brian, what's going on? Dude, it's a great day to talk MMA. It's just you and I in the booth today. I know. No Carson Ingle. He, uh, he pulled a Nick Diaz, if you will. <laughs> we'll you, get into that. He's actually returning my text, though. So he's, not, he? he's not completely Nick Diaz MIA, but he's pretty close. Oh, well, that's close. But uh, we got an action-packed show we got a lot to get to, including, of course, some uh, interesting fight being developed for later in the year, including Tito Ortiz and Antonio Noguera. And, of course, we got a big guest, don't we, Brian? Who we got scheduled? We have the man, the host of MMA Live, Mr. John Anik himself. So uh, he's going to be in the next segment, actually. Can't wait for that. That is big. So fun. we're scheduled to be joined by him. We'll hit up a lot of topics in the, in the sport, as well as kind of ESPN's influ- influence on the, uh, the sport right now. They're covering it more with MMA Live and... All that good stuff. So that should be a great interview. And, uh, of course, Brian, where can they reach out to contact you for those in the audience? Yeah, you know, it's uh, the day we live in. Twitter. Twitter's the best place to reach me, at ESPN Dub, D-U-B. Nice. So follow me. I, I, you know, I tweet stuff, post links to the show, and, uh, yeah. So feel free to throw questions follow. out there in comments, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll respond right away. Right away. Beautiful. Right away. I'm on my phone all the time. <laughs> you are. He actually is. Uh, but let's get right to it. Top story, a wacky week in UFC last week, of course. It was originally scheduled George St. Pierre will face Nick Diaz on October 29th in UFC 137. A fight that I couldn't wait for. A fight you've been talking about. This is our, what, our fourth episode, and you have been yapping about this fight. It's maybe the fight of the year. Yeah, the fight of the year, because, you know, Nick Diaz is coming over here from Strike Force Champion and just mauling everybody, completely dominating people. So. Like the UFC always does, they put fights together that people want to see. Everyone right. thought this fight couldn't happen initially because the rumor had it that Strike Force fighters um, couldn't come over to the UFC and vice versa. But obviously, there was contractual loopholes that Dana White pretty much made with himself and his company to make this fight happen. Right. And then no, no show. N- Nick, yeah, no Nick, show. Nick, to a press conference to pre hype the two of them two to press pre hype the fight and uh, yeah. a whole mess. Dana White tried to reach out to him. Didn't get hear back from him. Couldn't hear back from him. The only time he heard back from someone was Caesar Gracie, uh, Nick's pseudo father. Like called him during UFC 137 um, press conference. <laughs> D- during the press yes. conference, we have that cut for you coming up. But uh, you know, it was just bizarre. And Nick Diaz was on thin ice to begin with. You know, Dana White has always said, "I would love Nick Diaz. I love him as a fighter, but he just doesn't want to play the game." And showing up to press conferences, doing the proper PR media relations that the UFC demands of their fighters nowadays, yeah. he just is on his no. own schedule. Nick Diaz came out with a statement a little bit after that, a day or two later, said, hey, I'm not ducking anyone, I'm just here to fight, I have no interest in any other stuff, kind of... Wishy-washy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we Nick Diaz is one of those guys where you really don't know what he's thinking, or even try to guess what he's thinking. And you know, I believe him. I, I don't. I think Nick Diaz. Nick Diaz isn't afraid of anybody. I know that. So if there's some other problem or issue, you know, is behind the scenes that no one really knows about. But he, you know, he's not a. Fi- he's not afraid to fight anyone. It's just weird. It's very weird. So as a result of the whole situation, Dana White changes the card for UFC 137. George St. Pierre will now face Carlos Condit, who got the call from Dana White and accepted right away. It was in tears, according to Dana White. And now Nick Diaz. You know, despite that little stunt, is still in the card. Dana decided to keep him in the card, but now he will face B.J. Penn. On the co-main. On the co-main. Your thoughts on the decisions and the switching of the fights. Should Nick Diaz still, first of all, be in this card after what happened? Uh, I don't know the conversation that Dana and Nick had or, or Dana had with Nick's people. Um, Nick's a great fighter. And I think, as opposed to kicking Nick Diaz out of the UFC... He just took away his title shot, demoted him like that, you know, that way. And who knows? May- maybe, maybe Nick Diaz wasn't ready for the title shot. But um, I think the way it worked out, Carlos Condit and BJ Penn, coincidentally being on the same card, uh, was kind of a blessing in disguise. And it it was able to, for the UFC to make the 
easiest transition possible and p having Carlos Conant fight George St. Pierre. And you know what? Carlos Conant is deservingly so. If he would have beat BJ Penn, he would have been the next in line anyways. Uh, Conant's on a four-fight win streak right now. You know, th three straight knockouts. Uh, th TKO'd Roy McDonald in, you know, three fights ago. But he's been on a, he's been on a tear. So, you know, he had the big win over Dan Hardy, KO'd him. And uh, Dong Hyung Kim, who's a Right. Awesome wrestler in the division, and you know, here, here you go, Carlos Conant, another up in, or another welterweight that hasn't fought George St. Pierre yet. So this is interesting. Now, some people think that Conant actually will present a much more difficult matchup for George St. Pierre. There are even That's analysts <laughs> that are picking Condit. Yahoo even said that Condit could very well win this fight. Uh, MMA Live and John Anik, of course, host that show. I told you this off the uh, before we started the show. Some of their analysts is even picking Condit as well to win this fight. What is uh? Do you what's? How would you co compare and contrast now the difference now between a Saint Pierre Diaz fight to now a Saint Pierre Condit fight? And are you buying some of this talk that Saint Pierre could get knocked off here? Well, on on paper and the way the fight will probably go, it's probably going to be the same exact fight. I was more excited with the Nick Diaz because it's Nick Diaz, but Carlos Condit, like Nick Diaz, is a stand-up brawler who will not back down and will come at you. So I think. As watching it, we're going to get the same kind of stylistic fight that we were going to get with Nick Diaz and George St. Pierre. Um, but, you know, Carlos Conant's on this tear, you know, four, four straight de decisive knockout victories in the UFC hypes your stock a bit, you know. But I, uh, I, 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 I think Carlos Condit, I don't see him beating George St. Pierre. Everyone always says <laughs> when there's someone else, this guy's the guy that's going to beat George St. Pierre. But you know what? George St. Pierre <laughs> kind of does, kind of like toys with his fighters and the fact where Josh Koscheck and all these guys are these dominant strikers, Jake Shields, dominant strikers who are going to stay, I'm going to stand and bang with George St. Pierre. He can't strike with me. What does George St. Pierre do? He strikes with them, and he outstrikes them. He broke, you know, Josh Koscheck's orbital bone, couldn't fly home from uh, Montreal after the fight. It was so bad. So I, I, I think George St. Pierre uh, is going to grind this fight out, and I don't see Carlos Conant beating him. Even though I love Carlos Conant as a fighter, but I just don't see it. So you think it's not a uh, not an easier, it's not a harder fight, not necessarily easier. It's about the same for uh, Saint, if you're George St. Pierre. Like, what are you feeling if you're George St. Pierre with all this stuff? Uh, what's your mindset? Well, George St. Pierre is an all-time great and a pro, so I really don't think he's going to get affected by this. The thing with Nick Diaz fight, that's a little bit more emotional for George uh, because the whole. George dominated Jake Shields, who is Nick Diaz's brother, pretty much, uh, total training partner, completely dominated him. So there's a little bit of that going on uh, with that fight. And, you know, Nick Diaz always talks and always makes fights interesting. Carlos Conant is way more laid back, lets his fighting do the talking, kind of like George St. Pierre. So I think there's going to be, there's obviously going to be less hype behind this fight. Um, but as an easier fight, uh, it's, I, you know, it, it's it's apples and oranges. I don't think I think it is. It might be a tad bit easier fight. Whoa! I think it might be a tad bit easier fight. <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. Now let's talk about Nick Diaz going against BJ Penn. Couple things. First of all, before we get into that, with his situation, there are some people that think he should have been suspended. Some even say fired. If other regular people could miss, you know, an important event in work, they could be in that kind of line of trouble. He does not. He avoids that. Is he kind of on two strikes? If he pulls this stone again, is he gone? I mean, where 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 is the bottom line here? Well, the way Dana White operates, it's not black or white. He takes every one situation and kind of judges based on that. And to this point, we really don't know what's going on with Nick Diaz. This odd, weird behavior. Um, you know, and, and going into this fight before, I thought Nick Diaz was on two strikes already. This this very well could have been his third and final strike to cash to back out. Of a title fight, one of the biggest <laughs> title fights of the year. You know, your your first fight back in the UFC in years. Um, and Dana White's come out and said, "Look, I can't trust the kid anymore. I just can't. I can't take him at his word." So he's done damage. He has done irreversible damage. Um, but the fact that he's fighting on the co-main event against BJ Penn, I think at the end of the day, Dana White knows the fans want to see this guy fight. And but he's kind of hurt the fans, hasn't he? I mean, if you're a well, fan of his, aren't you a little disappointed at him? Because you just, I mean, you were looking forward to this St. Pierre fight. He cost himself that. And can you trust him, especially if you're Dana right. White? You're going to no. book him, you're going to promote him, and then he no-shows 
that's going to hurt business. No, yeah, I don't think I don't think you can trust him. But at the same time, I, the fans want to see him fight. Uh, you know, it, I'm, I was disappointed in 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 that. But at the same time, I still I would rather see Diaz and BJ Penn than no Diaz. It's just it's just that kind of kind of thing. With, with Nick Diaz, you kind of go in, you you kind of are expecting this almost. You know what I mean? And it's it kind of just comes with his character as a fighter and just this crazy you know guy who will fight anybody. You know, really, really keeps to himself and then just comes out and just throw, throws down. So I'm looking forward to it. I think him and BJ Penn match up pretty well. Now, you mentioned BJ Penn. He's in this match. Uh, of course, last time I saw BJ Penn, if I'm not mistaken, was, uh, what, uh, in Australia, I believe, right? Against your, uh, Against your boy, John. John Finch. We got John Finch news coming up later on yeah. the show. But uh, BJ Penn in UFC 127 Australia had that draw with John Finch. He now draws Nick Diaz. Your thoughts here on this fight early on, Nick Diaz and BJ Penn? Well, this right here is probably two the top two strikers in the welterweight division up at this point. Um, I, this is very interesting. This is going to be closer than the George St. Pierre Diaz fight, uh, but it's going to it's going to be kind of hard to predict in in the fact that we haven't seen Nick Diaz actually fight in the UFC in four years. And yes, he's dominated Strike Force, but we all know Strike Force is not the UFC. This is the big leagues. BJ Penn, his last four fights, he is you know two and one and one. He's got a draw and two losses, and his only win was against Matt Hughes. So, BJ Penn, you really don't know where he is at this point in his career. He needs this win. That's for sure. That's what that's what you do you do need. He needs this win. Last question before we go to break. Uh, with this change of the card, for pay per view purposes, does it hurt it? Is it the same? Could it possibly even do better than expected? I mean, what, what, yeah. what, what do you think? I think, if anything, it might hurt it a little bit just because it's two champions and it's Diaz against uh, George St. Pierre. And, and like I said, when you get a Nick Diaz fight, he's going to talk, he's going to promote, he's going to be a sound clip. So it's, it's, that whole aspect is kind of so out the wind. I think it does hurt. But, you know, it's going to be a great card, and it's, it's not going to destroy it, but it doesn't help. Still, draw St. Pierre's a big draw. Sure. But it may not get maybe the big, maybe, I don't know what they were it's expecting, still, 800, 900,000. It's still going to be a big draw because it's George St. Pierre. Yeah. But it's not going to be as big as it could be. No, it couldn't. Well, we're going to take a break uh, here on round three. And when we come back, we're scheduled to be joined by John Anik of ESPN. That's next as you're listening to round three on ESPN1080.com. ESPN Radio 1080, the team. Uh, the fight is official, you know, so... Caesar uh, Gracie's calling me. Hey, Caesar. All right. Yeah, no, that's cool. Let's, let's... I, I'm going to call you around 3.30. Let's talk. All right, bye. He said, I apologize, and I agree with you 100% in what you're doing. And we're embarrassed. And, and I don't even know what to say. I haven't slept much. I've been trying to chase Nick Diaz all around town. Nobody can find him. He's hiding from everybody. So he thinks this is as weird as we all do. ESPN 1080 here, uh, round three. Eric Lopez alongside Brian Winnegar. That was Dana White from last week's press conference. Uh, not a good mood there, was he, Brian? We are confused, aren't we? We're all a little confused. But you know one man who's not confused? That is, of course, the very own ESPN's John Anik. John, welcome to the round three. What's up, fellas? Good to be with you. Great to join us. What's your thoughts on this whole fiasco, uh, drama, soap opera with it is Nick Diaz? Well, you know, I think by and large the punishment fit the crime. You know, uh, as I've said before, uh, Diaz had some self-destructive behaviors. You know, I, I don't know if there's a condition there. You know, I don't think the UFC asked him to do a ton, just fall in line a little bit. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, he didn't prioritize the press conferences. So I think something had to be done. You know, I think they needed to, you know, fix the main event quickly uh, to send a message. They did that. And then... You know, when the dust settled, it, it seemed to make sense to uh, have Nick Diaz fight BJ Penn. You know, I think the hardcore fans think uh, the card's actually gotten better. Uh, you know, I think the punishments hit the crime. Do you think this will hurt the pay-per-view buys, or will it be about the same that it would have been? What's your thoughts on that? You know, a lot of people are excited about Nick Diaz, and I think the hardcore fans, you know, he, he does have a cult following, and I think that that sometimes speaks to the casual fans. So I think his presence on the card... Uh, was important, and, and I don't know that the pay-per-view number is going to be all that impacted. I, I do think Diaz is a slightly bigger name than Carlos Condit, uh, but I think Condit 
probably has a better chance to beat GSP. So it, it's a huge night regardless. I think the numbers will be close. Right. Now now we have BJ Penn against Nick Diaz, arguably two of the best strikers in the welterweight division. How do you think, find that uh, fight breaking down? Really intriguing, you know, and uh, I, I guess I would lean towards BJ. I just think that his will to win and, and his experience in that cage uh, compared to others I think will pay dividends. But, you know, Diaz is a tough guy to put away. He's proven that. Uh, he certainly proved it back in April against Paul Daly when a lot of us thought he was, you know, concussed. Uh, it's just a great fight, and I think two guys who, you know, we talk about as trying to drive the casual fans to, uh, to MMA, and two guys I think in BJ Penn and Nick Diaz you'd always point to as guys you would – throw on TV for, you know, people who aren't familiar with the, the sport. So, uh, you know, I'm excited for that night, man, in a lot of ways. Now, you mentioned, uh, you think you're, are you one of, I know I saw MMA Live this Friday night, past Friday, some of the uh, analysts picking Condit to even beat St. Pierre. You think he's a real legitimate big threat to St. Pierre. Why is that? Well, I think it more speaks to the fact that there are so few guys who haven't had their shot who you think actually could do something with it. It's a short list. Condit's on it. Uh, maybe Jake Allenberger, uh, Anthony Rumble Johnson is on it. But, you know, a lot of guys have just been able to do nothing with it, uh, Jake Shields being the most recent. So I think his combination of striking, uh, and he really does live up to the natural-born killer moniker. I mean, he really has killer instincts and, and finishes fights. But, um you know, yeah, I'd say he's one or two in terms of the welterweight right now who hasn't had a shot, who's best equipped to uh, to beat George St. Pierre. We're speaking with John Anik, host of ESPN's MMA Live. Uh, let's move to next week, obviously, the big fight, Jones and Rampage Jackson. It's, uh, it's going to be huge. Your thoughts on next week and all the hoopla there, a couple weeks, excuse me, and it's going to be a pretty uh, big fight. Everybody's going to pick Jones, obviously. He's the heavy favorite. I know Brian's already locked as a guarantee. I, I love Jones. I, I, I think I think Jones is so unorthodox, and his his uh, reach is just so much bigger than everyone. And Rampage is the guy who can just stay forward and, and come at you. How do, John, how do you see that fight breaking down? Yeah, I think John Jones is about as unbeatable as any fighter in any right. weight class. You know, I've said, I think, in my ESPN.com chat, I give Rampage a 5% chance to win. And, you know, you hate to take that strong a stance, given what Rampage has done in his career, but... Uh, the guy's wingspan in John Jones is 84 inches, and uh, just the combination of, of skill, uh, evolving skill, I should say, but athleticism, speed, and the size. You know, with John Jones, I keep coming back to the size, and even Rashad Evans, uh, who's so capable. I just don't think any of these guys are going to be able to combat that size as long as Jones, uh, you know, doesn't get caught, and I give that a 5% chance of happening against Rampage. Can Jones be the next big star in UFC, uh, we, we've discussed this in our past shows about Brock Lesnar. He, he makes the needle move. Everybody knows who he is. St. Pierre has a big draw, big following as far as pay-per-views and in Canada. Uh, can Jones be that guy, the next guy for UFC, or is that going to take some time? You know, I think he can be that guy, you know, I, and I think in a lot of ways he would want and relish that role, but I don't know that that's necessarily his nature uh, to be demonstrative or, or even vocal. Uh, to be that guy. You know, I'm not saying a Floyd Mayweather type extreme, but I don't know that he, you know, wants to get up and beat his chest. And, and then there is something to that in the fight game, I think. Uh, but in terms of the skill, uh, you know, that's where, where you prove it. Uh, and other than Anderson Silva, I really think he looks as unbeatable uh, as anyone. So certainly he can do that. And certainly, you know, the big sponsors, Bud Light, Case with and everyone else has already caught on. And, uh, you know, he's got that smile, man, and the skill. He, uh, he's got a bright future. I just don't know if he wants that huge spotlight. Talk about all those big sponsors. Now, of course, UFC signed with Fox. Uh, you excited to see UFC promos on NFL Sundays? Yeah, it's great. I mean, talk about great promotion. We always talk about the UFC being this promotional machine, but to get Fox behind it. Uh, and, again, coming back to those casual fans, you know, I beat that drum because I think it's important that you expose people to this sport because when they're exposed, I think a lot of people catch on and, and get addicted pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, putting that, you know, the UFC on network TV uh, is unlike any other promotion ever, even flirting with being on network TV. I think it's huge, and, you know, hopefully it does what I think all parties expect it to. A seven-year deal is a long commitment, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's the biggest thing for the mainstream acceptance, I think, that we've had in MMA uh, really since Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta took over. We're speaking with John, ESPN's John Annick, host of MMA Live here on Round 3. Eric Lopez alongside Brian Winnegar here on ESPN 1080. Uh, John, let's talk about... Uh, ESPN, and of course, MMA Live, you're hosting the show uh, Friday nights. Uh, we want to see it more often, maybe every night. Uh, any chance of that maybe now as the sport grows more, that ESPN maybe puts more content and you can be on more often? 
I hope so, man. I wish I had all the answers. You know, I, they, they just launched some new afternoon shows, and I noticed one of them wasn't MMA Live, uh, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we're just plugging away. You know, we're, we're very thankful to, to have our spot on ESPN, too. We'd certainly like to have a consistent time slot. A lot of that is about being on earlier in the day when, when you're not subject to, uh, to live events bleeding over. Uh, you know, we would really take any time that, that was live and, uh, and early. But, you know, it is what it is. I think we've made a lot of strides at ESPN. It's a big place with a lot of, uh, you know, other obligations in terms of sports. And uh, we just got to keep beating the drum, and, and hopefully, you know, it gets the respect that it deserves, uh, you know, someday down the line. And you've covered it more. ESPN has covered the sport more. Uh, do you know when was the turning point it was when ESPN decided, you know what, yeah, we're going to embrace this, we're going to cover it, we're going to send you to the fights. Was there a turning point there? Because there was a while there where they kind of ignored it, and then they just stopped ignoring Next thing you know, hey, there's Molly Carum there covering the fight back when she was working at ESPN. Well, give me the, the, the process there, how that transpired. Well, I guess, uh, you know, as humbly as I could say it on behalf of MMA Live, is I, I do think the show had a lot to do with it. You know, its creators, Anthony Mormile and Kieran Portley, uh, really pushing it on the digital media side. You know, and once you have sort of a, a viable show that, you know, in the NFL Live format uh, for MMA, you know, I think it's hard, sort of a hard product to ignore. Uh, you know, speaking of nothing, but, you know, take the host out of this, you know. I, I just really think that product helped drive it and expose more people to it. Um, and then we started doing a few live shows and, and had the budget to do that. And, and, you know, that translates like a college game, I think, for MMA. And, and I just think that opened up a lot of people's eyes. And quite frankly, you know, we haven't been on the road since February. I think you need more of that. You know, if I could do one thing, you know, it would be to have, you know, MMA live at every UFC pay-per-view afterwards. Uh, I think that the MMA fans deserve that and would tune in for that. At that hour, I think you do a good number. So, um, you know, we're plugging away. Hopefully there's more to come. Well, exactly, and you talk about MMA Live being an NFL Live format, and I think that's the progression of the sport. We need to talk about it as we talk about the NFL, we talk about Major League Baseball and the NBA. I think the sport really does deserve that, and it's about educating the, the common fan who doesn't really know about the sport. But back to MMA Live, one of your new analysts, Chael Sonnen, how's that guy in real life, John? Like, real, Is he really that, like, just crazy? Does he give you different answers every day? Like, how is he, how is he in real life? Well, he's a, he's a walking soundbite. Yeah, you know, I know he's, he is. He's, uh, he's definitely genuine. Uh, he definitely is considerate. You know, I'm asking about my daughter, and, uh, you know, he's very uh, much more tame, I think, off the air. Uh, not that he doesn't believe everything out of his mouth. And, you know, people think sometimes I'm fabricating laughter sitting next to Chael son, and I assure you I don't need to give that guy, you know, courtesy laugh. Right. Uh, he's a quick-witted. Um, he earns it. Yeah, I just think he's entertaining, and I, you know, I also think too he assesses the fight game in, in a refreshing way. Uh, and there's really he doesn't sugarcoat anything. I likes to play that role, but but believes everything he says for sure. No, and I I think he's great for the sport. I mean, come on, we're, MMA it's it's the fight game. It's all about promotion, and the way he promotes a fight is like none other. And of course, he's fighting Brian Stan in his next fight. Um, that'll be interesting. Obviously, you think that's going to be the winner. Of that's going to fight Anderson Silva eventually when he gets uh, back healthy. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think Chael Sonnen will get that opportunity if he gets by Brian Stan. I hope Stan would be afforded the same opportunity because I think he would be worthy. Um, but, yeah, uh, I think that Sun and Silva 2 fight is about as big as it would get for a UFC rematch. And, uh, you know, Chael will get to flap his gums a little bit because when you're fighting a guy like Brian Stan, who is literally the most impressive human being that I've ever come across in almost any walk of life. You, you know, there's nothing to say about that guy. So, but, you know, I like Stan as an underdog. You know, I think he's got a real good shot to, to beat Chael. Yeah, he's scary in that middleweight division. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, unbeaten down there. Yep. Uh, John, of course, can't ask, uh, Brock Lesnar is back. We'll fight on December 30th. Were you caught off guard that he is back this soon? And what is your expectations for Brock now uh, making his comeback on a real difficult fight on December 30th? Yeah, no doubt about it, and I think power to both guys, Overeem, for, for taking this fight in his UFC debut, and for Brock, given, you know, the multiple bouts with diverticulitis to come back, and maybe maybe shorten up uh, his his timeline for coming back a little bit. You know, I feel like I'm running out of superlatives talking about all these fights, but it really is, you know, an unprecedented four months here, and that's the capstone, uh, December 30th, you know. I, I think for Brock, you know, I would. I don't think he's got too much left, and not because he doesn't want to be great or couldn't be great. I just think that's a uh, a very debilitating condition to have to deal with, and the way he pushes his body, I just don't know that those two things jive. Uh, and you know, if Over Overeem beats Brock Lesnar uh, in whatever condition, I think that's a great way to vault him. Uh, so 
great fight, and you know, I just hope for Brock's sake that uh, he's healthy enough to go. That's John Anik, ESPN MMA Live. Uh, John, Brian, and myself are big fans of yours. We enjoy your work. Feel free plug everything uh, you're doing at ESPN because uh, people need to check it out. And I know our audience, our fans, uh, the audience, MMA fans, will enjoy it. Uh, plug it away. I appreciate it, guys. We uh, we're on MMA Live, ESPN two, uh, most Thursday and Friday nights. Really, one of the two. Uh, best of luck setting the DVR. though. live sporting events <laughs> precede us a lot, but extended versions always yours at ESPN.com slash MMA. Uh, we're on Twitter as well. You can also follow me, John underscore Anik, and uh, we do a chat Wednesdays, uh, 1 Eastern at ESPN.com. We take your MMA questions for an hour. Uh, just go to ESPN.com. Right on, John. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on. Enjoy the show, fellas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. John Anik, ESPN, MMA Live. That was fun. That was great. He's a great guy. We enjoy his work. He's done a great job for ESPN. Oh, he, he's money. I mean, he's helped that coverage, too. And just like he was talking about, it. It's creating that NFL Live, that Major League Baseball, that Baseball Tonight, that kind of format that just legitimizes the sport and talks about it on, on a bigger national level. And he's, you know, total pro. He, he does it right. They got Chael Sonnen, in, you know, Rashad Evans, Kenny Florian, you know, Stephen Bonner's on that, Franklin McNeil. Like, it's a great, great show. They do it right. I agree with him. The next step is not only maybe uh, weekly, but if not as well, being at the fights. He talked about that. I haven't been there since right. February. You know, I grew up, uh, we all grew up with the boxing coverage that was always at the big fights. It's a little harder UFC because it's every month, and that's, there is an economy budget factor that kind of takes an effect. But I do think uh, they need to be at more of these fights and cover it, and I think that's the next step, and ESPN will uh, treat it that way, where you can see John Anik reporting live on SportsCenter. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, and uh, I think that's exactly the direction that they're headed. I agree. A smart leave uh, for them, but yeah, that's exactly right. Absolutely. So we thank John Anik again. Check out his work on ESPN.com. When we come back, some interesting fights developing, including one of Brian's favorites is back. Oh, what? To fight. He is, isn't he? He's, we, oh, he's definitely your favorite. We'll tell you who that is, that and much more, next as you're listening to Round 3 here on ESPN1080.com. ESPN Radio 1080, the team. And welcome back to ESPN 1080's Round 3. Here on ESPN 1080, the team, Eric Lopez alongside Brian Winnegar. And Brian, once again, where can the people reach out to you? At ESPN Dub, that's ESPN D-U-B, on Twitter. Of course, you're no John Anik, but still, people can reach out to you just as much as they can reach out to John Anik, who we had the last segment. That was fun. That was great stuff, huh? Yeah. That was great. I hope you enjoyed it in the audience. Great stuff on ESPN1080.com before uh, we get to the last part of the show. We got Insider Show, ESPN1080.com Insider Show, Sundays 10 to 11. Brian used to be a, is an alum of that show. That's where um, I got my start. That's where you got your start. We're going to have a big Sunday show this weekend. We're going to recap the FSU-Oklahoma game, which will be aired right here on ESPN 1080. Number one, Oklahoma, and number five, FSU. It doesn't get any bigger than that. We also got UCF-FIU game. We'll have coverage of that. Articles on ESPN1080.com. Many of you may have seen already uh, Jason Collette's recap with yours truly from the UCF-Boston College game. We also have online... A nice little uh, NASCAR chase preview with yours truly and Tracy Den, who you can hear on 1 to 3 on Fridays with Brian Winnegar. Yeah, right. I, I saw you, uh, you know, taping that segment today, get, yeah. getting that done. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm once again, like, like I said, I'm for the progression of this sport, and I'm going to get on every single show <laughs> or try to get on every single show on this, pro, on this station and just blast MMA. And a big show next week. We will preview the big UFC card. See, I, I, last segment, I kept saying next week, next week. I, I was caught. I'm too excited. You're too Ryan. excited. I'm I too mean, excited. I can't, can't get here quick enough, right? It's Jones and Rampage. It has taken place because Nick Diaz, GSP is not happening. Jones Rampage, my new favorite fight of the year. Your new my favorite new fight announced on round three. Wow, that's big. You know? That's big. So next week we're gonna break down that card. It's gonna be very interesting. We'll make our picks as well and. Uh, Preview, preview that fight as well. So a lot of great stuff on ESPN1080.com, so check it out uh, anytime you want. And, of course, you can also find us on YouTube uh, throughout the year. You can even catch the previous Round 3 episodes uh, and check out what we said before and how smart we are. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, um, feel free to leave comments. Absolutely. We always encourage that. All right, other news in UFC, some interesting fights. Tito Ortiz and Antonio Noguera, two guys that maybe at the beginning of the year people were counting out as retiring this year, as now reportedly will agree to fight at UFC 140 in Toronto on December 10th. 
Now, these two had a history. They previously had agreed to fight on UFC Fight Night 24 in March, but backed out of it. But now it looks like they're going to agree to a fight again. Uh, your thoughts on this uh, development? Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those fights where it, I think it's an elimination fight. It's one of those fights where it's two big names who can draw, and are, are, the winner becomes relevant. The loser, I think, gets cut. Uh, <laughs> I just do. I mean, well, Tito Ortiz, I'm pretty sure if he, if he goes down, he's going to get cut. Uh, just because, talk about a guy on his final strike, even though he has kind of behaved himself, but he just doesn't, he just doesn't have it anymore. He's a, a wrestler. He was great six years ago when, re when you could be a dominant wrestler, when you could be dominant at one skill set. Nowadays, especially in his division, light heavyweight division, you got John Jones there, you got Rashad Evans there, you have Shogun there, you know, you have Machida, you've got these great guys who just will destroy you and are great at everything. Uh, Little Nog, you know, he, he's a guy who came in with a lot of hype. His first fight in the UFC just completely destroyed Luis Kane. And then from there, he's just kind of been on, on the downturn. So, you know, it's one of those fights where Tito, he's going to get, you know, he's going to get this fight, but it, it doesn't really do much for me. Other fights announced. Brian Winnegar's boy, his favorite, John Fitch, back. After an injury, he's back. He has agreed to fight Johnny Hendricks at UFC 141. That is December 30th. That is part of that Brock Lesnar card. But John Fitch, who hadn't fought since UFC 127, when he had the draw with BJ Penn in Australia, is back. Uh, your thoughts on John Fitch? Who would have thought a draw to BJ Penn would put you back so much? But I guess that just proves the fact where if you get a title shot, you better perform. <laughs> you better perform. John John Fitch got absolutely dominated by George St. Pierre. And he's been on this huge fight win streak, had a little draw against BJ Penn, but this huge win streak, and he you know, he gets a lesser opponent in this up and comer, Johnny Hendricks, who it's a huge fight for Johnny Hendricks. But uh, I, I I have John Fitch absolutely dominating Hendricks, uh, proving that no he, concerns of rust. No, from the injury. No, no. I, I think Fitch is he's right up there as as the he's within the top three of, in the welterweight division. I think hands down. And the fact that his last performance in the title fight when he fought George St. Pierre, that's the only reason why this guy isn't getting another shot at the belt. He is more than qualified. Uh, I just, I think Johnny Hendricks is completely out of his league. Uh, but, you know, a win for John Finch against Johnny Hendricks doesn't really do much for you at all. So Now, there's speculation. Of course, some people thought Fitch was originally, they thought, was going to fight B.J. Penn in a rematch at UFC 132, but he was hurt, and that because B.J. Penn is occupied with Nick Diaz, that this is why he's going to fight Hendricks. Do you see him, assuming he gets past Hendricks, could we see a rematch with B.J. Penn, or you think they got bigger plans for him, or is he at the bottom? He got to work himself up. Where do we? Where's John Fitch right now in the big plans of things? Um, John Fitch is kind of in that limbo stage where the B.J. Penn and Diaz fight has to has to go down, um, and then of course Con Condit and GSP has to go down, and I think the outcomes of that are going to dictate where Fitch goes from there. Uh, it really surprised me that Fitch dr was forced to draw against B.J. Penn when he fought him. Here's a guy, BJ Penn, who's gotten dominated by Frankie Edgar, all five foot six, 155 pounds of him, soaking wet, and you know he goes against like a bigger opponent in John Fitch, you know, and, and draws him out. BJ Penn is is just this weird uh, fighter who you can't really predict, and John Fitch uh, getting past Johnny Hendricks is going to put him in that mid range still because of his performance in the title fight, and what, as long as George St Pierre is there. At the title fight, I mean, I think John Fitch is just, you know, walking in the middle of nowhere. Interesting. Uh, other news, Anderson Silva, of course, is going to be out for the rest of the year. He's taking it out. He's got a bit of a shoulder injury. He started feeling some pain, uh, I believe, a few weeks before his last fight. And he's not going to have surgery, nothing serious, according to reports. But he is going to be out for the rest of the year. Hopes to return in early of 2012. Any significance here? I mean, were we expecting him to come back at the end of the year, or is it not a, you know, it's a much well-deserved break? Well, next year, Anderson's going to be 37, okay? So his days are numbered as, be, as being a, a great fighter. So, yeah, I think it's a big deal when he goes out for a significant time because a fighter's window, his career window, is so short. You only fight three times a year if you're lucky, twice if you're a big-name guy. But, you know, you skip out those months, you skip out fights, and, you know, you're a whole year older, 
And so, yeah, I'm kind of looking at that. I would have loved to see him fight earlier, but, uh, you know, I, I guess he really has no choice at this point. No, you got to take care of yourself. E- even though, didn't you say it was announced that he was going? He had this medical issue going into the Akami fight? Apparently there was some reports. Uh, they've kind of not commented on it, but there were some reports that, yes, he started feeling this about a month before the fight, but he went ahead and fought. And, well, and then, of course, before that fight, he later told uh, everybody that he fought Chael Sonnen with broken ribs. He didn't yeah. announce that, too, so... Seems like his last two title fights, he's been banged up, he's been hurt. I don't know if that's old age, if it's wear and tear, it probably is. Um, he's still the best fighter in the world, but him taking significant time off just shortens that window. A couple of moments left on the show. Uh, of course, we had John Anik on the last segment, tremendous stuff. Give me your thoughts on some of his stuff he said. 5% he gives Rampage Jackson. Are you in the same boat? Oh, I go less than 5 <laughs> But no, I, no I, I agree. I completely agree. John Jones is a freak. And like I said before, Ramp- Rampage is a great fighter, but he's so straight up and down. And I think John Jones is so unorthodox, such a better athlete, and that huge reach, he's a guy that can hit you with a swing back fist, a guy that can hit you with a flying knee, you know, and a guy that can take you down at the same time. So I just think it's ha- nothing personal to Rampage. Love you, Rampage, but John Jones is just that good. We're going to have a lot on that fight next week on the show. You're going to want to tune in right here on ESPN1080.com. Big round three next week. Big coverage of Rampage Jackson and Mr. Jones. Brian's gonna be you're gonna be a demand you're gonna be the highest man in demand in this station. You're gonna be on Tracy Den probably previewing the fight. You're gonna be on with Beta Sports, Mark and Jerry's probably gonna break down that fight. It's gonna be all over the place. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to get someone special for that show too. We'll see. Ooh. We'll see. I, you know. Pull some strings here. That could be big. Uh, we thank John Ennick for joining us here today on on this edition of Round 3 on ESPN1080.com on ESPN1080. Let's see.